my name is Steve Trapp. I'm with Exalta. I'm the uh, uh, North American Strategic Accounts Manager. And um, this is kind of an accumulation of a lot of things that we have learned working with our shops about gross profit and, and, and optimizing gross and net profit. Um, a big, big focus for this, obviously, is going to be gross profit. And our goal is really what we call a drive for 45, OK? The goal is to try and get 45% gross profit on our job. It's not going to be just one home run, a lot of little things. So I brought a panel of people, and their names are listed up there. They'll come up uh, in the order they're listed up there. But we're going to draw them into the conversation and ask them to assist and show you a couple of really cool features within the various programs that they, that they, that they provide to the industry. Uh, and obviously, a lot of these things can be provided by other resources. These just happen to be the people that work with us on some of these different projects. So obviously, what we're going to do today is we're going to cover heavy emphasis on the income statement. We'll talk about weighted gross profit and how that works. We'll talk about sales uh, for the first kind of sales and optimizing sales the first hour, and then costs and reducing costs the second, second hour. And we'll end with a pretty cool uh, presentation on uh, throughput and flow through a shop that we're going to show you. Once we make a profit on a job, now we're going to put more, job, more jobs through the shop. Again, the P&L is going to show us the, our, our, the results. It's the scorecard of what we did for that month. Not a big surprise. Um, it basically is going to have a couple major sections. It's going to have sales, it's going to have costs, and it's going to have expenses. So sales, are when you write an estimate, are all the things on the estimate. So each, each estimate has basically its own P&L or a breakdown of the sales or sales mix. Then we have the costs. Those are the costs that, we, that basically directly apply to that car. So let's just play a little game. Would a, would a cost or something directly be applied to the car be a spray booth filter? No, right? A spray booth filter gets used throughout the month or over a couple of months. So that would be a what? An expense, right? So costs are things that are directly associated with a car, OK? So we'll, we'll use that kind of as our definition as the day goes on. So as we go through this, obviously we have different categories of sales. We have body, paint, parts, paint materials, and sublet, and some miscellaneous. Um, Many people are putting scans in sublet, sublet other. Some people put it miscellaneous. Some people put it mechanical. But scans and OE research would go in one of those categories. Um, so those are kind of our categories of income. So every, P, every um, estimate or final bill has a, basically uh, a made up of this breakdown. Okay. Then again, the costs are related directly to that. So the labor costs are anybody that touches the car. So who is the person that everybody debates about who, who, who is or is not cost? Anybody know? The estimator touches the car a little bit. He's not fixing the car, so he would be an overhead, right? But who else is kind of debated? We have the painter. Who works on the car after the painter? Detail, right? And so everybody goes, well, that person doesn't count as a cost. They do. As a matter of fact, what do you think the average is for a cost per RO to detail a car? If you look at the, at the range. It's interesting, if you take the t your detail labor cost divided by the number of cars delivered, that'll tell you your detail labor cost per car. We see some shops will be 120 bucks, and some shops will be like 20. Okay, so there's a big variance there, right? So it's how much time do they spend washing and, and, and polishing that vehicle. So there's a cost that's associated with that. Um, so again, just to kind of run times, I skipped a couple there. The parts obviously are the parts that are installed on the car. Um, we have the paint materials. Those are consumed while you're repairing the vehicle. Sublet costs are basically to return the systems, the, whether it be the AC system, you know, the, the glass system, whatever it is, to, to working order. And then, of course, the miscellaneous costs. So those are things like rentals, any discounts you might do. Uh, if you do a DRP discount, it would go there. Any lost or broken damage parts associated with that car would go there. Those would be your costs. So as a result, you end up with something called gross profit. Okay? And I call that the magic formula. So if you look at it, the magic formula in our business, and applies to every category, there's always a departmental sales, departmental costs, and departmental gross profit. So for labor, there's labor sales, labor costs, labor gross profit. That's the profit and loss for labor for that job, or job costing kind of tells us that. So again, this happens to be for the overall job, is saying $200 or $200,000 less than $109 means that we're making about 45%. Now, when we work a lot of shops, we'll start They'll start at 38, 39, 40, 41% gross. And they think, I'm doing pretty good. The industry average has actually risen near 45. Now, why is it that we need to keep going up? What things, have, if you go out in the trade show floor, you'll see it. What kind of things you're needing to invest in now that you didn't have to buy in the past? Scan tools, new welders, right? 
there's lots of stuff that we're having to spend time and effort in. The estimators are, we're having to pay them more because that's a very difficult, I mean, finding a good estimator is like finding a unicorn, right? They're hard to find anymore, so we gotta pay, pay better to try and take good care of these people. So obviously we need to start raising our gross. So again, we use that gross to pay our expenses. And basically our expenses are broke down in, 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 in categories. So we kind of have these, you have your overhead wages, your employee benefits, your facilities, your maintenance, your IT, your utilities, your education, your professional marketing, and miscellaneous. The sum of all those, once you subtract off your gross profit, is in your what? Your operating profit, right? Which is kind of getting close to the bottom line. So that's where we want to ultimately do it. So our job, we're generally not going to work every month to do a lot to adjust this, are we? These are pretty much fixed, right? So we kind of got to cover that. So the more cars we fix at a higher gross profit, the faster we cover this or break even, okay? So again, the result obviously then is they take the gross minus those expenses equals our operating profit. Then we have the non-operating expenses, which would be like taxes, interest, and depreciation. That takes us to a total overall net. So these things down here, expenses, are kind of generally fixed. Your rent is going to be fixed. Your salaries are kind of fixed. So you're generally trying to raise your sales, right, and keep that gross profit number as high as you can. Okay, that's kind of our, our objective. So. The way we make our drive to 45 is four different ways. We'll cover them throughout the hour here. First one is basically verify the sales mix at the time of the estimate. So the sales mix that we're talking about is not really, you shouldn't be sitting on Saturday when you're closing the ticket going, oh my goodness, my sales mix is off. I have to fix that. It's way too late, okay? The repair was done. The approach to the repair was already taken and the car has been fixed. So we want to move our attention to gross profit right here first to the sale. So the area to work on with the sale, uh, the estimate, is sales mix. We basically, the sales mix is a percent of the sales, uh, total sales that are made up of that category. And we want to try and drive more towards what? Parts or labor? Which one's more profitable for us? Right. So we're making some people 58, some people 60, some people 62, 64 on labor. So the more labor we can sell, obviously the more money we make for, for, for a job, right? So that's our goal, to sell more labor. Okay. What we want to do here is we want to then take that gross profit and pay off the overhead and make the net profit. So we're going to calculate that gross profit um, and, and, and we, it's kind of that same magic formula, sales minus cost equals gross profit. Again, part sales minus parts cost equals parts gross profit. Here is a number I wanted you to kind of look at. And those of you who hadn't looked at this before, kind of an interesting way of looking at, uh, at this net profitability. I just did it for one category here. So in this example, the, the shop's body frame and mechanical, or total body we call it, is 27.8, okay? That is an increasing number, so we continue to drive that up. Why, why is an industry driving more body labor? What kind of things are the insurance companies encouraging you to do more of? Repair, repair right? Where they're telling us to repair more parts rather than replace. So that number of sales mix for total body as an industry is rising. Okay. The good news is that's our most profitable category. If we make it pr a profit at it, we can make 62.5%. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm hypothesizing. I'll show you. We'll share with you how to do that in a little bit. So you then calculate that out. It tells you that of my 45 point whatever, 17% of our, almost 50% of our, our overall profit is made from that one category. Okay. So if you look at all of them, so I all I did, by the way, was I took this times that equals that. Just, I didn't want to get crazy with all the, the next slide with all the math, right? Do you see how I'm doing that? Okay, so here's, here's, here's what's going on, is I'm basically saying I'm taking, the, this case, parts, or excuse me, paint, times, the, again, 63%. I'm making 11% of my 46 in this example from paint. Parts is, is 38, at 32%, we're making about 12% of our overall 40, 45, and you can see this down. So these all added together, equal 46, you see that? So I've, I've gone a little bit crazy and made some great assumptions here, because I'm saying this is pretty typical, I can get to 46, but I'm saying somewhere I'm gonna slip here a little bit to where I 45 is my goal, okay? So my goal is every time I close a ticket, I wanna have 42, 43% gross. If, if that's not true, I want my estimator to go in and make a line note, or a, a note in the file. What is the note in the file gonna tell me? why or what happened that caused me to not make 45, right? I, I was unable to get the, uh, I, I had to give away this or I had, to, I had to do something on goodwill on this, but it should be documented. 
Because what happens is you go looking at your P&L at the month and it's 38, 39, 40, 41. It's not what you want. It's too late to change that. You need to make every ticket try and make 45. Don't allow it to go below that. So the first thing in time of estimate is we want to look at the sales mix. So we want to do more repair if we can. Paint and detail is a pretty steady as an industry right now. It's not going up, not going down. It's pretty steady. Parts have gone down. It used to be parts were about 41, 42. They've dropped below 40. Paint material is about, ten, you know, Mitchell or CCC, you're right in that 9.73 to, to 10.4 average. So you're pretty steady there. And then sublet's going up. What's going on in sublet that's making it go up right now? I mentioned earlier. Scanning, Scanning and OE research, right? So we're doing more of that, so we're getting more of our, we're getting more sublet back in. That is somehow, somewhat affecting these two, um, but it is, it is out there, okay? Does everybody kind of understand this? Kind of, kind of a different way of looking at it, right? I'm kind of surprised I'm increasing the price. The what? Well, it's decreasing because we increased our, our body and we've increased our scanning. So that's affected the parts overall, okay? And we're doing more repair. Okay, you'll notice that this parts, excuse me, the, the parts margin, a couple of years ago, what was the parts margin? Anybody remember? If you were at a 20 group? 25. Yeah, 25, 26. So what's happened? What, why is it higher? Because everybody's going to think, oh, you're, we're making millions of dollars on parts. We're not. What's going on? What have happened to part prices? We're using more what kind of part? Aftermarket. Aftermarket and salvage parts, right? So as a result, we had to make, we make the same basic dollars, just a higher gross percentage. The way we buy, the way we, you know, part prompt pays, things like that are all part of that, okay? All right, so everybody kind of good with this? So again, all those ROs below 43, 42, you pick a number, make a note. Okay, now, here's kind of, basically I'm showing you kind of where a shop that, in a sense, struggles. This is a very busy slide, but I took a shop that was struggling, and I put them on here together with it. So this guy was at 24% sales mix. He was basically not replacing parts. So you can see his gross profit on, on labor was only 57%. We said it was supposed to be what? 62, 63, right? We, his, his, his paint and detail is only 15, which means that the number of paint labor hours on a job is what? Higher or lower? Lower. So instead of getting nine paint labor hours per job, he was only getting 7.7. .7. So he's missing a bunch of paint labor by missing uh, in, in, paint, paint inside of panels, weld burn damage areas, and things like that. Um, they were obviously replacing all their parts, or a lot of parts. It's very easy, it's cool. You just take your mouse, you can click, and stuff shows up from China. It's like amazing, right? And it's so easy to do. And so it's so easy for an estimator who's maybe not familiar with how to fix cars to go, I'm just gonna click. It's just gonna show up, I'll return it if I don't need to. The techs are thinking, oh, that's good. We'll, we'll get into a little bit on why that doesn't make sense in the end. Um, you can see their paint materials down because they were down in paint, paint and detail labor. The, the paint materials are down, and of course they're sublet. They weren't getting paid enough or at all for scanning or OE research. They, their insurance companies were telling them no, and they, they weren't justifying. Make sense? So you can use, I just wanted to show you how two financials, two totally different uh, situations, how their numbers might change. All right, so repair versus replace. So what we're basically looking at here is gross profit. So we can see that our gross profit right now is roughly 27, or excuse me, sales mix for body is, we use the 30, 20, 10 rule, which is we want to get as close to 30, 20, and 10 as we can, which means that we need to sell about 14, 15 paint or body hours per job. Okay, so how do you change that? How do you change that? You're, you're at the time of estimate, what do you start looking for? Extra damage, extra procedures, never manufacturing, or, I'm never saying that ever. We're saying learn the P pages, learn how to write a, write a sheet, and write as much time as you can justify to get paid the proper amount of hours on that job. Justify your, your body labor times. Just work hard to get that 14 hours on average. Okay? So again, that's what we're after. All right, so if we can do this and we can earn 62%, uh, we're going to make a lot more money. Um, and so what we're going to ask you to consider is, again, continuing to do more replace. Now you're going to say, oh, you've sold out, Steve, to the insurance companies. The DRPs must be paying you. No. I'm telling you that you can make a profit and still repair his car safely by fixing them with, by repairing things when it's, when it's appropriate. If it's not appropriate, always replace, okay? So I'm not saying compromise safety or integrity at all. What we're saying is just look for those situations where we can repair 
when it's possible. Now, when's the, when's the exception to this rule? What time during the year, in the Midwest at least, or in the, in the North, where, what time during the year would we make an exception? Winter, right? Why that? Why, do, why would we change our rules in the winter? What's that? We can't get part, that's fair. It's harder to get parts. I give you that. But what we, what we want to replace in the winter, why do we want to replace? Because labor is what? Do we have a shortage or a surplus? We have a shortage of labor. So when we have, when I've, the, the shop is slammed, I get weeks of work, then I probably want to switch it just because I, I have the ability to turn more, more hours to the shop. But as soon as I can, I'm going to try and fill the shop back up, work uh, no vacation, you know, try and do things to try and uh, get the people back into the shop. Here's a, here's a key point. Initially, when the techs find out that we're going back towards repair, they balk because they've gotten kind of used to swapping parts. And I'm not saying they, they're lazy. I'm just saying it's easy to swap parts. You unbolt it, you bolt the new one, and it's fast, right? Here's the deal is their efficiency on replace is 125 to 135%. They skinnied those crash guides down. They're, they're on the size of the panel, number of bolts. They got it calculated down pretty tight. If you're good at repair, you can do it 200 to 225 if you're good at it, right? You can, what kind of things could you invest in? They have the, the cam auto de, glue on dent pulling. They have the Miracle and the other different dent pulling systems to help enable this. So the more things like that that we can invest in, which are available here at the show, to help us you know, optimize that efficiency, we now make a lot more money on repair. Okay? So you've got to kind of sell the techs on doing this because their natural inclination is to swap, want to swap parts, especially if they got used to it. Okay? Yeah. All right, so if you look at the difference between repair and replace, everybody's like, well, you're going to make less dollars, Steve. Um, I can tell you that you can get paid more p-pages when you repair than when you replace everything. Because your severity does what when you replace everything? It goes up, right? So those parts start adding up, and basically your severity goes up. Now, what happens to the volume the insurance company send you? And I'm, again, I, it's not me choosing this. What happens when your severity goes up? The insurance company give you more or less work? Less, right? So the idea is that we basically, when you repair, you're able to drive severity down, and, and if your gross profits are enough, you'll make the same dollar amount. And you're going to get more work out of it. So it's kind of the deal. All right. All right, Scott, could you, I'm going to bring Scott Wheeler up. He's going to talk about our, our, uh, our focus on judgment time and uh, plastic repair. OK, everybody hear me OK? Okay, I, Steve um, kind of covered a couple things that, that I would like to go a little deeper on, especially in today's environment. Um, if you're going to write more repair, that's great, but you have to look for the right labor opportunities that are there, both in P pages and additional. Um, he talked about some of those numbers um, when you're looking at what we call the 30 20 10 rule, what he talked about. And in today's environment, the bigger the job, the less pain hours that you see on a vehicle. And I'd like to say it's because. Uh, um, that just diminishes, but I think sometimes it's because we take the easy way out. In today's environment, of all the estimators in this room, um, anybody learn to manually write an estimate? Show of hands if you started by manually writing an estimate. There's not a lot of hands in this room, right? So the rest of you, it means you learn on the computer and you learn by point and click. Does that make sense? The problem is in today's environment, point and click does not cover everything. Okay, so if I'm putting a quarter panel on the car, I can point and click to put that quarter panel on. And it's going to do that, and, but that doesn't cover the paint time to the rear body panel, doesn't cover the paint time to the rocker panel, um, or even the burn time if I have to repair it when I weld it on. So we can't live by point and click by itself. We have to think the process through, and we have to look for those opportunities for additional operations as we go forward. So when we start looking at body and paint labor sales opportunities, what, where they are and how we find them, I always tell you, write a, write a safe repair. When it gets to wintertime, to Steve's point, and I've got a boatload of work sitting out there, I can process more vehicles in the same period of time, probably by replacing. And that may make sense. But I still have to be cognizant of whatever my DRP and whatever my other guidelines, if that's who I'm looking at, how I do it. But, but any of these, whether I'm repairing or replacing, I'm looking for those additional labor opportunities. Um, when you're looking at body, do you make a solid repair versus replace decision? And it's based on a bunch of different judgment things. Is it safe? Can it be refixed properly? What's it going to stand up like? Um, part of the things that we need to change is are our estimators in today's environment also trained? 
How many estimators in the room, if I, if, and I'm just using that as a generalized term? Okay, quite a few. And there's a, just a shortage of quality officer estimating people as there is in technicians in today's environment. Would you guys agree to that? I mean, it, we, we struggle to find all the right people. As we put people in over their heads in a matter of speaking, because we train them quicker, we throw them out there quicker and kind of throw them in the water and hope that they swim, we've learned some bad habits. And the bad habits are is we just kind of learn to point and click and do certain things that don't help us try to find some of these things out. How many of you write to repair plastic a lot? Or how many of you have technicians that repair a lot of plastic? Okay. The problem with repairing plastic is if the estimator doesn't know how to write it, what do they write? They write to replace it, don't they? So by the time the technician gets it, what's he doing? Ab absolutely, because most technicians in today's environment are taught to follow what's written. The one thing I don't want to do is I don't want to do something that I, I don't want to do something different than what the estimate expresses, and then I get charged with work build versus work performed, right? I need to do it and follow it that way. So we got to look at it a little differently and we have to start challenging our estimators to understand what does plastic repair look like in today's environment? When can I do it safely? At the same time, I'm going to be scanning vehicles and I'm going to be pulling OEM repair procedures. And when I do that, does it allow for me to repair that plastic part? Recently, um, I had a customer that repaired a rear bumper cover on a Mercedes. And it, what, what, he looked at it and thought this will be a simple plastic repair. And he did so. At the end of the day, the sensor wouldn't went on after he repaired it, and it wasn't on before, because he changed the thickness of what the bumper itself was, which now the sensor didn't work properly. So we always have to be cognizant of pulling and understanding what the manufacturer says we can or can't do. So it, it's, it's looking at that, it's adjusting our times, and it's about talking about the right things to be able to do. And I want to cover that more in a minute. On the refinish side of it, what are those additional refinish operations that we just talked about? Did we look at truly what a painter must do? How many of you have a painter walk in when the car's in the booth saying, hey, oh, by the way, I got a list of like five things I need here? Okay? And if that happens, how do you move that forward? How do you engage your painter earlier in the process to ask them, what are those additional things you're going to do? I teach, and I've done it here years ago, I teach a lot of repair planning. A lot of people call it blueprinting. There's a lot of different terminologies for it. But I'm a believer anytime you can move these things forward in the process, there's a better chance you're going to get paid for them. Okay? So if I can engage my painter right up front and say, hey, go out to the vehicle, take a look at the repair order, take a different marker, and just mark any of the additional things. Is it a specialty paint? Is it a, a tri-stage or a specialty coating? Is it, uh, does it have a gravel guard that we didn't see? Anything that you need to do that's a refinish operation, the insurance companies will pay for that because it's an actual thing that needs to occur as part of the repair of the vehicle. We just need to get the right people to understand it. Now, I've worked for paint companies for a long time, but I'm not convinced I could repair plan a car and 100% get every paint operation right. That's why I'm a believer you need to engage the right people at the right time to get all these things. Um, then we start looking at mechanical operations today. Steve mentioned it um, as a sublet, but whether it's mechanical labor or a sublet, in today's vehicles, we're having to change the way we think. How many are doing pre-scans on every vehicle coming in the shop today? And the scary part is there's not more hands up, right? It's almost forced to do a pre-scan on every vehicle that comes in and then a post-scan. Okay, challenge is, how do I get paid for a pre-scan? There are certain scenarios where they're not, you're not getting paid for it. But I have a lot of owners that are saying, I'm making a decision to do it regardless of whether I get paid or not, because from a liability standpoint, I feel I have to. And I also think that as long as we continue to do it and list it, we eventually will get paid for it. I think the industry is moving that way. The technology is forcing us that way. We have to look at it that way. So what can you do if you're not getting paid for scans? What should you do? Just not list anything? How many of you put pre-scan on the estimate as a line item regardless? I absolutely believe you should. List it as a pre-scan. Don't put no charge. Don't put included. Just put it as a line item, pre-scan vehicle. Because I'm going to date myself here a little bit, but years ago, we never got paid for car cover, flex additive, hazardous waste removal. We continued to put that on those because those are actual billable things that we needed to do. Contrary to belief, it is not 
part of the cost of doing business. It is a separate operation we need to do. So when it comes to scanning, do that. And list it as a line item, and you should be charging for it. Have those conversations with your, ins your uh, insurance partners if you're on a program or um, the adjusters if you're not, saying, I I've got to scan the vehicle. I have no choice. You're not going to release me from all liability of it, so uh, I'm going to scan the vehicle. And then in today's environment, uh, some insurance companies have required that I'll pay for a scan if you give me specifics. If you can say there's a reason why I need to scan, not just because the, the OE put a position statement out saying you've got to scan every vehicle. So in those cases, if you do a little data research, you can actually find out where it says check DTCs because of this reason. So we are required to do a little bit more research in the past. Research is not free. There's a cost of that. And at some point in time, we need to be listing that and getting paid for it. Okay? Um, OEM repair procedures. How many are actively, truly actively pulling OE repair procedures and feel like they're in every vehicle? Okay? And I see a few hands, which is good, but I, and Jack knows me, I'd go back and do the challenge just. I want to go in the shop and actually look and see that happening. Okay, you got to prove it to me because it's easy to say we're doing it, but in today's environment, how do you not? Everybody thinks about one thing that kind of changed the industry, and that was that John Eagle lawsuit, right? That kind, of, that, that kind of changed the industry a little bit. In today's environment, owners are worried about the liability of fixing a vehicle wrong. We want to make sure we're fixing cars right. We want to make sure our technicians are fixing cars right. How do we know that they're doing that? You know, a lot of, a lot of estimators and managers and owners don't fix cars. So, so we suggest pulling OE repair procedures, and we believe that you should be able to bill for doing that. There's a time associated with it because the manufacturer re really has statements and processes to pull to be able to get this. So we use something, I, I call it the Red Book process. I, yes, go ahead. Uh, when, like I have uh, old data collision mm -hmm. and we have auto text, but sometimes with all data you cannot find the procedures from, from OEM and when we have to pay, you know, <coughs> like, to get the information from dealership, it's like a $60, $40 just to, sure. to enter and, you know, and get there is a way to charge the insurance company for yeah. that or? Can I give you an answer to that in just a second here? Because that's a great question, and I 100% and agree. We, we call that a subscription cost, right? Even if, you, even if you have all data and you have a monthly or a yearly cost to it, you're still paying for all data. Am I right? There's still a subscription cost to that. So the Red Book process says the first thing I want to do is if I know a vehicle's coming in and I've got a repair that's going to require pulling over repair procedures, and and you could pull them on every one, but we have a minimum base which says safety, structural, welding, electronic, and um, hybrid type. Let's make sure we're pulling the right repair procedures for these type of vehicles, because that's, it's not all the liability, but let's put it this way, it's the biggest liability, okay? And I don't mean this wrong, but if, if, if you don't, uh, fix a, a bumper right or, or even a quarter glass, it may fall out, but it's probably not going to have the liability issue of a car where, where the safety system doesn't operate the way that it was intended to, do, correct? So the Red Book says, I'm going to pull them in advance, okay? If not, I'm going to at least pull them at disassembly during repair planning. I'm going to put a copy, I'm going to put them in a book, they're going to go on a dash so everybody in the shop visually can see I have repair procedures for this vehicle and I expect the technician to go over it and sign it. The signing part says, yes, I've looked at them and I understand them. Now, you can't 100% guarantee that he's done all that, but again, the thought process from a liability standpoint is how do I reduce mine? Does that make sense? I want to make sure I'm fixing the cars right, so I'm going to provide him with the proper information to fix the cars right. And then I'm going to try to hold him accountable to reading that. Okay? But back to your point now, then one of those is on the side here is here's an invoice. And what the invoice states is both time to pull repair procedures, and I'm, and, and I'm just going to use a generic figure. Okay? He put an hour down at let's round it off and say 50 bucks an hour, right? 
So he put pole repair procedures $50, but then right below that he has a uh, um, subscription charge, right? So whatever subscription, if you've got, a, if you've got to go to a GM site and pull um, GM, uh, uh, usually it's a three-day subscription for what, $29.95 or whatever the number is, shouldn't that be passed along? Is that a true cost of what it takes to do business today? And it, it, will the insurance company reimburse you in most cases if you present it right? Absolutely. Because you can't fix that car right without pulling that information. So I hope that answers your question. I would, I would put it back. In this case, um, they used a third party. It's called Collision Data Resource. They just used a third party to pull it because now a third party vendor is providing the information just like subletting it out to anybody else. The point to me is I just I want to get paid for that. I want to get paid for I want to get paid for my scans. I want to get paid for my OE repair procedures. And the only way I'm going to do that is is to be able to substantiate that I pulled them and pass the subscription card along. Yes. Okay. So did you write them down? Uh, he covers me. Take my word. Okay. Thank you. And if not, I'll, I'll check with me after. I'll list them for you again. I'll write them up on the board. Um, so again, those are billable. Judgment time. Steve talked about judgment time. He's absolutely right. Your good technicians will beat judgment time usually pretty well. But it's getting harder and harder to beat database book time or the crash book time, right? I'm sorry. I'm, a, I'm dating myself again. I'm a crash book guy. But that database, it's getting harder and harder to beat the time it takes to put a fender up. Okay, and he's right. It's about 125 to maybe 100% efficiency, or, or you, can do, you can do an hour and a half worth of work in an hour. Judgment time, if you can't do two hours worth of work in an hour, then, then you're probably struggling a little bit as far as that goes. And some really good technicians that may be higher, and that's part of where we're at. Okay? I talked about plastic repair earlier. If the estimators don't understand how to estimate plastic repair up front, they're going to have no idea how to write the estimate the right way to think plastic repair, right? And if you don't do plastic repair, traditionally what happens is you send the bumper cover out. What do you buy? A remanufactured. So you, let me see if I got this right. You send it to somebody else to fix it and send it back to you. Yet you have talented people that could be doing it. Now, I'm not saying every technician in your shop can do plastic repair or maybe even should do plastic repair. We normally do what we call a PRT, plastic repair technician. In disassembly or blueprinting, we'll isolate those parts that can safely be repaired into an area, and then we'll ask the technician once a day, the A technician or rotating technicians, to go over where I can fix two, three, or four plastic items at the same time. Am I going to be more efficient doing multiple ones at the same time? Absolutely. And it's going to incre increase. Now, it's not going to change your gross profit number, but I will drive more gross profit dollars through it during the same given period of time. And anytime I'm figuring on plastic is you have to understand if it's repairable and you have to understand the economics that go with it, okay? The, the availability of the part, the cost of the part versus the cost to do that. So we suggest and have said there are estimators courses for plastic repair. And I'm going to give you just a brief example. If you were in an estimator repair course on plastic, I would challenge you this way. Can these, what, what can be fixed in the first place? And most of us limit our thought process to bumpers. But in today's environment, there's a lot of other opportunities besides that. Understanding, the disclaimer is always, it needs to be able to be approved by the manufacturer and safely repaired. But it, it can be headlights and tabs in some cases, or, or even fender shields depending on the cost. The next thing is, we, we take, put them through a series of, is this repairable? And they have to answer the question, would you repair that? Now, I have technicians. I know some technicians. I'll guarantee you they would fix anything if they had their way. I'm not saying everything should be fixed. But they, they, they're pretty capable that they could fix most things. What we need to determine is, does it make sense to fix it? Is it uh, uh, economically smart to fix it? And is it going to be a proper repair? So we'll say, can this be fixed? Okay. In this case, yeah, I, that can be fixed. Okay, it, it's got a crack, it's two-sided. I gotta add a, a, for high stress or a mounting location where it's at, and it's got a little bit of a complex shape. 
So there's some things I can do to identify what it takes to fix that, and now I can start to dollarize that. I can put some time to that to say what is the right amount. Here's another one. What, what's your thought? Would you fix this? Hard to see from a picture, and I, I understand that, but it's missing a tab up here, and it's also got some pretty complex shapes in here where it's, where it's damaged. Um, when we put this to the technician, and, and, and we wrote this data and information with the 3M's leading plastic repair, and we also did it um, through one of the nitrogen welding companies to, to get our information. There's just reasons why I would not fix that. We also created a hybrid matrix that says, okay, what's the time in this? How many inches is it? And what does that equate to in time? Um, how about if it's cracked and the time to that versus a tear? Or what about uh, gouges or spider cracks or a number of tabs? Do you add for, for uh, deformation? So there's different things you can do to say, how do I estimate this? Because the last thing you want to do is go pull your technician off the line every time they tell you. Okay? So here's an example of, of how that would run. If you looked at it, is that, would, does that make sense to you? Yeah, it is. So how much, when you ask any leading insurance company, if you took a, let's say a bumper was worth, let's just say $100, I know, just to keep a percentage, up to what percent will they pay you in repair time? 75? Yeah. So as long I bet, as, I bet as, long as you to 80 can look, or 85. as long as you can look them in the eye and say this justification justifies $80, let's use it, uh, to keep it simple, 80% or less, then we'll let you go ahead and repair it, right? And our guys are making 65% versus saying it, sending it out to LKQ, they, they fix it and they make the 65, they send it back to you and you put it on and you make a small markup, right? So that's what we're kind of saying is, but a plastic repair tech who's assigned doing this who's good at it, who's got, the, uh, so what, what do we do with the bumpers? As you throw bumpers away, right now you, th you throw them over there and you don't tear all the tabs off. What we're suggesting you do is you pay somebody to take the tabs off of all the bumpers, have them organized by brand, right? And then when, it, when a Honda bumper, here's all my Honda tabs. So I've got tabs already, so I don't have to make a tab, I already own them, okay? So you got to, you know, again, this is a profit center, we're in the labor business, right? Right, hey, Polly Vance and Graham have some pretty creative ways of making tabs today. It used to be if a tab was off a bumper, it was done. That's not the case anymore. You can remake a tab pretty quick to be able to do that. But again, if, if this doesn't meet your market area, and again, I can't, we will not set prices for any one area. This was for a specific area, a matrix we built for that area. Does that make sense? And, and, and we actually got a compliance from an insurance company that agreed, and they sent their adjusters through. So just, so just understand, adjust the matrix for your area depending on the time. The point is, is with an estimator, you gotta teach me how do I estimate that? What is time? Because a lot of estimators that we have today did not fix cars. They, did, they came out of the industry in a different way than having fixed cars, so they may not understand it. If they don't understand it, it doesn't end on the estimate. If it doesn't end on the estimate, you're replacing it and down goes your labor and your, and your margin opportunity. So again, back to this one. Obviously there's a tear there and a crack in the end of it. Can it be repaired? Yes, there's three damage areas. We kind of itemize out what they were. The replacement cost of that bumper is $464. If I took the time, I just took a standard time of $60 an hour. This would be applicable to whatever your area is. Okay, and I added materials. Why did I add materials? I've never seen a bumper yet or anything else come with the materials attached, did it? There has to be a material cost because refinish time is calculated off an undamaged panel. There's technically no calculation for any plastic repair or any of that primer that goes with it. Okay, so if we're going to calculate, I'm going to throw something in for those materials to fix that. As a result of that, the cost of the repair, the materials, I'm still at $345 versus a $464 repair in this case. 74 cent, would, you, would, would the insurance company agree to that? Could you look the customer in the eye and say, I can do a great repair for that? Keep it in your technician's hands. I'm not waiting for a part. I don't have to send the part back once or twice. I know what I'm doing. I'm in control of that vehicle, which helps me. And, and it is an original equipment part. I haven't, I'm not replacing it with something other. Here's a case where I've got a couple of cracks. And again, I've got two areas of damage. 
I've got a little spider crack that I added for and I got, and I got some distortion. And then on the lower one, I got a bumper tear. It is two-sided, so I got to fix both sides, correct? And I add for the style line. All this is is the estimator understanding what I have to do to fix it. And if we don't teach them, how are they going to know? Okay? Cost of the bumper is 412. I got an hour and a half plus two plus five. I end up at four hours. $240 plus materials. So yes, I got 265 versus 412. I'm only at 64%. Does that make sense to everybody? I'm just trying to do a calculation. By the way, this is that bumper repaired, and you can see it was a quality repair as a result of it. So, yep, so I'm going to hand it off. If we want to repair more, in today's environment, our biggest challenge is we can't teach point and click. We have to understand what it truly takes to fix a repair today, and we have to make sure our estimators have the same training to understand that, or they're not going to write it in the first place. It's never going to appear on your estimate. That makes sense to everybody? All right, so we have a product. So you to turn it on. We have a product that we work with, uh, and, and there's two things we're going to show. We're going to show this, and we're going to show a new SDRS product that just came out this week. Um, we'll, we'll show, we're going to talk about that as well. But first, we're going to show estimate scrubber, which is a way for us to verify the sales mix before we go ahead and submit the estimates and the insurance. Okay, so hello, I'm uh, with Estimate Scrubber. We are a web-based application that helps, or what we're trying to do is help shops and MSOs and associations become more standardized and, of course, more profitable. Uh, we do scrub estimates, uh, but, of course, we also offer a whole bunch more. So let me make sure. There we go. Uh, one of the main things that we've just come up with is a uh, pre-estimate check sheet. And we're talking about the um, P pages for uh, a car. And of course, as you're doing research and you're trying to come up and figure out exactly what you have to put together for this process of creating an estimate, you're gonna to wanna to gather up all the information you can have. I just heard that you, know, you want to have all of that information. Some of the research you need to do is with the P pages. What our software does is our software goes through and we have a place where you can go through and click on a specific area where there's some damage, and then choose any one of the three estimating providers, and it'll bring up all of the pertinent P pages. So you don't have to go through all the research, you don't have to go spend time trying to find it all. It's all right there, you click on it, and it shows you all of the non-included or included items within, on that specific area. Again, just something really to try to make things life, life easier, a little more convenient and faster. This is what our scrub looks like. When you do scrub an estimate, and again, you can scrub CCC, Mitchell, and Autotex. Because we are a web-based application, all you need is that estimate in a PDF text format. So it doesn't have to come from your estimating software. If you have an insurance company and they send you a PDF of that estimate, you would be able to scrub it, even if you, it was created in Mitchell and you only have CCC. So as you scrub it, um, you just upload it to our server. Our server takes about 10 seconds and pops up. It'll have the estimate on the side, so you can go through and verify and you know, see what the estimate looks like. And then on the left-hand side is the opportunities that our software has found. It's gone through, it's looked at the estimate, and getting information from some great resources like SCRS, ASA, collision advice, and we've also created a handful of our own procedures. Uh, it shows you items that are suggestion for included or not included items. I'm sorry, not included items. Uh, we also have up at the top, one of the first areas is the 30-20-10 guideline. That takes the estimate, looks at that particular estimate, and shows you exactly where it sits within that guideline. As you go through, um, each one self-explanatory and then gives you a suggestion. Now, with our software, what we've done to try to make it to, to help with the standardization is it is customizable. So you are able to go through as a shop, as an MSO, as an association, and create a profile, modify it. Uh, we have uh, one of our shops, this is AC Vac and took ours, customized it, and then attached 
a standard operating procedure to that area. This helps the estimator go through. They know that uh, this is exactly how we, how we do it. This is how we should do it across the shop, across the MSO, across the association. Um, one of the other tools that we have is the dynamic scrubbing results. What this is, is we've taken over 34, or information from over 34,000 estimates across the nation and up in Canada. And we break it down, we take the 44 top non-included items, show what is on your estimate, and of course we go by hours or, I'm sorry, hours, we don't do the found price because across the nation it's so varied. Um, and it shows you what the bottom 2.5% of the nation and all the way to the top 2.5% of the nation, what they're getting paid for that particular not included item. So it just kind of shows you exactly where you're sitting on this particular estimate uh, for alignment, it's an hour, where it shows you that the rest of the nation is getting on an average of 0.41. Now on the other side, those are the items that our software has gone through and found that is not on your estimate, but on similar estimates across the nation, it is included, or it has been on theirs, and what they're getting paid for it. So you can look and say, hey, you know what? These are things that I've done or that we're going to do, and you might as well try to get paid for it. The rest of the nation's doing it. You should do it. There's how much you get paid for it. Uh, Scrubber Wiki. Scrubber Wiki is another one of our, it's kind of like uh, Wikipedia, but uh, as you were, uh, or as it was brought up earlier about procedures. Again, standardization. You're going to find those procedures. You're going to want to have those procedures everywhere and present them to anybody who's creating an estimate. This gives you an opportunity to take and uh, attach a procedure to your software. And then any time that estimate is, or a similar car, make and model, is scrubbed, it'll pull up and show that particular information. So you can have different procedures, you can have different uh, standing operating <coughs> procedures, anything and everything, and assign it to a specific make, model, and then when your estimates are scrubbed, it pops up and you know, it's right there so you can see it. So again, the standardization is there and you guys are uh, staying consistent. Uh, we also have the ability that we're gonna work with uh, different manufacturers and start like as in this one, uh, it's a Toyota and there's the uh, airbag uh, recall. So you would be able to say, hey, there's a scrubber wiki, go and take a look at it and pull up that information. In a nutshell, that's it. We're scrubber or estimate scrubber, um, $85 a month for a subscription. Yes. To use it? No, how much, how much would they miss that you find? Oh, God. Yeah, it, you know, it depends. It varies so much. I'm sorry? <laughs> Not at all. And, and that's a huge thing. When I'm talking to people, I never want to say that our, or have our software say that the estimate's right or wrong. Because you guys, it, it, our software is not going to tell you it's right or wrong. Our software is going to give you the opportunity to look at it and say, hey, you know what? I did miss this. Maybe I should add it in there. Um, you know, it, it isn't saying, because we're not there, uh, we can't exactly see it. As he said, it was, uh, it's not a point and click. It is something to get your estimators to think and to look at and try to, and of course with the standardization of, and setting up the documentation, it gives the shop and the MSO the opportunity to say, hey, this is exactly how we're doing it from now on, here it is. How does it work with, uh, with, uh, does it work with any software? Like, um, 
it, it, CCC Mitchell and Autotex, and all you do is you take the estimate and print it into a PDF format and then upload it to the server. Um, again, web-based, so, and the cool part is if you have um, an insurance company that sends you a uh, Mitchell uh, estimate and you have CCC, you can scrub it and you know, see exactly what they may have missed or that you might want to make sure gets into yours when you get to it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, so um, Wikipedia, you know how Wikipedia works with the it's an encyclopedia that you can add stuff to? That's in a sense what it's doing. So whether it be, in this case, Southeast Toyota provided the data, you guys can add and say, every time I do a Toyota, it's just learning. It's becoming smarter. It's just like Wikipedia on the internet. Um, the SCRS version is very, very similar. There's this uh, 139 for everybody in the industry, $99 for SCRS members for the first PC and $21, I think, for every PC after. Um, the interesting thing that they added was, and, and by the way, if you're going to do this, dual monitors. You got to have dual monitors, okay? So you have your estimate on one screen, the scrubber or the SRS scrubber on the other screen, and basically have it drive it. The cool thing right now with the CCC, excuse me, CCC and the SRS tools, it actually will put the line on the estimate in the appropriate place on the estimate for you. So you just click and, and pop them in and they go right in. If you manually put them in, they, the, they don't get the star. If you automatically let it put in, it does still put the star on it for you. So it's kind of a little glitch, so it puts in the manual entry star because the system is pointing it, putting in, it's not a database driven number. So that's kind of a, a quirk, but really cool. SCRS just debuted it right before the show. You'll, you can go down to the uh, show floor and learn more about it. Um, so we had a question, yeah. Uh, it's, 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 theirs is a 99 for the shop and 21 for each PC in the shop okay. after the first one. Um, so and one of the other things, and Craig, if you, you don't mind jumping up with me, if you, can we have the two monitors on at the same time? All right, so Craig from CCC is going to come up. One of the things that we as an industry have never had the ability to do is look at KPIs on our estimates. The insurance companies had all these cool metrics for us. Six years ago, they came up with a product called Indicator, and Indicator does a lot of stuff. So, Craig, could you kind of just tell them about Indicator? Yeah, sure. So, uh, the first thing to know is Indicators is available both in a, and, and this isn't a sales pitch. I'm just letting you know that it, you don't have to have the management system to have this Indicators dashboard. And there's a lot of shops that I go to that don't know that they have this Indicators dashboard. So, if you have the estimating only system, you may have this. If you have the management system, you may have this. Uh, the point behind this is, it's just taking all that information, all the metrics that you hear from your insurance companies that have metrics on what you've been writing and what you've been uploading, you have access to all that same information because it's the stuff that you're writing, the, the, uh, everything down to um, average cost of repairs, total labor amount, repair versus replace, what your parts mix is. That's available for you to see all the time and drill down and drill down and drill down and drill down. Now, if you can go to the next slide, what happens is when you, when you concentrate on any particular tab up here, down here, now you're starting to drill into the data that's driving those numbers on the first page. So I can look at my current month. I had 63 appraisals. Here's the percent of those appraisals that were flagged with total loss. Here's the percent that were luxury vehicles. Uh, and here's my average total cost of repair. So when you have an insurance company talking to you about severity and how, well, your car your average cost of repairs is way higher than the average in the area, and, and you say, yeah, well, that's because 35% of my cars were luxury cars. So obviously the price of the parts is a little bit more expensive. Go ahead. The car is luxury. <laughs> so uh, I don't have a definition in terms of exact brands, but I obviously, we, we know the BMWs, the uh, Audis, Mercedes. Um, I don't know if Tesla is in there. Um, I could find that information out for you. So if you come up to me. Absolutely, and it is, it's by brand. But I, I don't, I don't want to misspeak and tell you the wrong brands, but I'll give you my card and I'll have that answer for you and uh, yeah. I'll get it for you. Okay. Um, so as you, as you drill down through this, you can get all that information and, the, and the, the real point of it is you should know your numbers. You shouldn't have someone coming in with a, a laptop or a spreadsheet and telling you what your numbers are and what's driving them and where your performance is. You should have access to your own numbers and, and why it is what it is. Six years, guys. We've had this feature available for six years, and it's available to all of us. Everyone that's using CCC for estimating. Um, you'll see up here. I mean, we didn't we didn't 
want to spend too much time on each of these individual tabs, but when you go across these tabs, you can break it down to your repair cycle time. You could break it down to how long is a car sitting between in and started, started to completed, completed to out. Um, I, I could tell you a story from Jersey, where I'm from, uh, the shop that I was running. I thought our cycle time should be great. I thought we were doing a great job. We were, we were bringing cars through the shop lightning fast, but uh, one of the insurers, the RPM dashboard, said otherwise, and I didn't understand why, and I had to go in and, and drill into this, believe it or not, and I found out that my front desk manager, when she got the keys on a Thursday, didn't want to bother the people. Uh, she said they already had their plans for Thursday night. She didn't want to tell them their car was done yet, so uh, she would call them Friday evening, and then they didn't want to pick up till Saturday because it's already Friday evening. So I had about two and a half days of cycle time after the car was done, <laughs> and then, believe it or not, I found it here. I felt foolish for not knowing that until that point, but that's how I found out. So uh, lots of filters. You can filter it down by all of your different insurance companies, by your customer pays, and that's the point behind this. So how would they need to find out if they want to learn more about it themselves? So you really got to contact your, your local CCC uh, rep, or you can call the, the 1-800 number. If you want the 1-800 number, I can give it to you right now. 1-800-637-8511. They'll ask you for your current CCC license number, and you just say to them, hey, do I have indicators? And that's the key word. If you say indicators, they're going to know exactly what you're talking about, and then you'll be able to find out on that call whether you have that already or if it's something that you want to look into getting. Uh, like I said, you don't have to have the management system to have it. Estimating package has it too, but it's, it's pretty, pretty key. Good stuff. All right, thank you, Craig. Thank yep. you. We've been talking more at Craig throughout the time. All right, so here's what, if you notice my notes on the side, here's where we make a mistake. We, we find our painter walks up to us late in the repair, or a bodyman walks into us with a second supplement later, and we're like, oh, my numbers as far as supplements, I'm, I'm showing too many supplements, and they eat it. And they consider that a marketing strategy. That's not a marketing strategy. That's a, that's a go out of business quick strategy, or certainly loss of profitability strategy, okay? So eating supplements is not what we want to do. What we're trying to do here is say, let's move this whole process forward. So what we're, this whole point, point one here is write that sheet as good as you can the first time so you get paid the 30, 20, 10, you get, you get your repair versus replace decisions made, you get all the parts you need done, okay? Does that make sense for the first point? All right, so now we're on to the second point, which is auditing, okay? So now we've torn the car down. Now, what, we're, what I'm advocating, and it's going to be different than maybe what you've heard from people in the past, is I'm advocating that you guys write your estimates off of the pictures that you were provided by the customer or by a physical inspection and order the parts. Now, my name is Steve. I used to stand in front of the same group and say that ordering parts twice is what? Muda. We used that term. We were all lean. We were like acting like we were super smart. And we, we forgot one key thing, and that is flow always wins out of, over some short-term waste. What can I do if I take a picture and get all the painted parts there when the car arrives? What can I do the day the, day the car arrives? What do I do with all those parts? Can I paint them? So I'm going to paint them. I'm going to paint both sides. I call it, we call that one touch, paint both sides. So we're gonna, the moment the car comes in, before we start tearing it down, we're going to paint every complex assembly. Why are we doing that? Again, this is different than what you've been taught. This is new, different. Probably freaking you out a little bit. Why? So right now, what we were doing with that was we take the whole thing apart. We had all these bins and bags, and we labeled them all up, and we put them in a bin, and hope five days later we're going to figure out how to put all that focus focus back together again. As a matter of fact, we even thought we were smart enough to have a different dude do it, okay? which is even crazier. right? What we're saying now is change that mentality. Send every complex bumper, complex uh, lift gate, every complex BMW door, if we've ever done BMW doors that are a pain in the butt, get it painted white or whatever color it needs to be, both sides, put it over here, put the new door and the old door right next to each other and disassemble, and we call it transfer parts. What are we going to find when we do that? We're going to find broken stuff that we didn't catch because we didn't have all together because we didn't have all the parts. What do we just prevent? A supplement and chaos. Exactly. We prevented all that. So it took a, it's a change. 
So if, if the customer says, I got an assignment, uh, I have an assignment from my insurance company, they go, I can't get here for a couple days. How about this? Send me some pictures of your car. And I get all the painted parts, anything I can pre-order I possibly can and get that done. Could you hire somebody remotely to do that? Yes. You could find a, 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 a retired estimator who just sits at home and does this. You could find somebody who's on maternity leave who could sit and do this. Anyone could do that for you, right? Because now at least I get a decent start and I get ha most of the parts I need coming so I can begin that process, okay? So we're good with that? Now we've repair planned it. So the car showed up, we checked it in, we did 100% disassembly, we were all taught, right? We did all that, we bagged and tagged everything, put it all in this proper category like we're supposed to. Now we're gonna stop a new process called auditing. What auditing says is, what if you were never allowed to do another supplement in this job? Have you done 100% disassembly and have you done it right? What would your score be, you think? Most everybody, and they do the first time, 74 to 76%. That means 24% of the stuff was missed. And all you gotta do to prove that to yourself is just count the number of invoices in our file. And there they all are, there's proof of four mistakes and just add those up and you'll see, your, you'll see yourself making those mistakes. So what we're suggesting you do is get everybody together for five minutes. Dude, Mr. Painter, tell me what you need. Okay, Mr. Bodyman, tell me what you need, right? Parts that we get everything we need to, right? All those people, we just stop for five minutes and just say, is this perfect? Your, your, your accuracy goes up and the scorecard improves and everything in the shop gets a lot, a lot, lot better. But we don't do that right now because we're what? Busy. That's the term we all use. So we advocate you do this. We advocate you take one of these tables and you label it repair. Another one, replace. And as you disassemble, you put them on there. And then you do it one assembly at a time, you get your dual monitor screen right out there. I, take it, I put it in the computer, look at my P pages, put it on the parts cart. It doesn't go on the parts cart until it's gone in the computer. I do this one assembly at a time off of all, all these areas and I just work my way through the car and then I do what? I audit it. We good with that? Change of process? Okay. Yeah? Can you see why you might make the mistake? Okay. All right, so. <coughs> I'm right on time, perfect. All right, so we're gonna do now, we're, now that we've done everything, got it in there, now we're gonna see if we're profitable, okay? And we're gonna check this profit a little bit before we actually finish the repair plan. Because we can know most of these things before and during the repair plan, okay? So obviously we know on this job, we had a, the RO sales with this, we know our cost, We'll, approximate, we'll figure out costs in a second, and then your gross profit. So we're wanting to get as high a gross profit as we, as we possibly can. So in this example, it was a 40, we lost five. So now we need to know five, so where can we pick up additional gross profit, okay? So what we know at the end of the job, we're gonna get one of these. It's a gross profit report. Whether you use CCC, ProfitNet, Summit, doesn't matter what system, everybody has a per, shop, every per job P&L, right? This should be the gospel. This should be what we should be looking at. We want this, this thing to read, basically, we need 45% on every one of them, all right? That's our goal, okay? So we're gonna basically look at this. Is the sales mix broken out, and is, there, is the sales mix per the 30, 20, 10 we're looking for? Are we able to see that, that we're able to see the hours sold and the hours flagged? We'll look at that as we, as we flag the jobs, and we'll be able to see the detailed invoices for each of the items we buy, okay? So again, the target gross profit is between 60 and 65 on labor, 29 and 33 on parts, 30 and 60 on paint, sublet, 20 to 23, so your average, 43 to 46, yes? All right, so now we're gonna show you how to get those gross profits. So that's, we're gonna go after this now, okay? So again, this is that same document we said earlier, no change, same thing as before. All right, so first thing we wanna do is you're gonna think I'm gonna go cutting labor. I'm gonna do just the opposite. I'm gonna call your body technicians, the guys that fix it right, they're the mentors for the young people, and they're the people that make sure that you don't get in any trouble with insurance companies and customers never unhappy, they're eagles. It is essential that you feed those eagles and treat them with kit gloves and respect. Those eagles are gold. They're gold right now. They're impossible to find. So take those eagles, and overpay them, reward them. What do you have to do to build an eagle? What do you have to spend money on? A lot of education, a lot of years of experience. They're, gonna, they're that person that can do two and 300% efficient. 
Now, I'm not saying that you want a prima donna that's treating everybody else in the shop with disrespect. I'm saying the person that's that true leader in your shop, they're your eagles. I'm saying basically those people can make in excess of 40% gross. You're like, well, you just told me how to make 45%. Well, you just gave away all of our money. No. What I'm saying is that eagle is going to help lead the rest of the crew. Because there's not, there's not going to be the number of eagles coming into the business. We've got to build eagles. We've got to build them. So we have to pay this person for taking the time to train. So they're basically that person that's got the, the good understanding of everything we got out there. Give them the most efficient tools you can. Faster drying. I mean, if you're doing filler, you should always use a Revo or some kind of a drying unit on that filler. Why is that? How long does it take to dry filler with a Revo? Three to five minutes. How long does it take to dry, dry filler air dry? 30, right? So what are they doing in that 30 minutes in between? Playing on their phone or they need another job. So now their mind's off of that job while we're on to another one. Where if we let them dry it, and you know, they lose their mind. So we want with mindset. We want to keep them on that, okay? We want to reward, we want to inspire them. We want them really, this book on Feed Your Eagles is out in 1993, so I'm, I'm stealing from an old book, but it is a still a really important part of this. All right, so a well-designed pay plan has been tested as the best and worst case scenario. It's really important here. Always use either a management system or Excel spreadsheet to do the payroll. Never use your head, because you will make mistakes, and you will find you screw your text or you screw yourself because you're doing it in your head, and you're, you move a decimal, you goof it up. Always, some form of automation. It sounds like a simple thing, but I'm telling you, it's, it's, a, it's a great way to catch yourself. Limit your overtime for all staff members. In most states, we have to pay overtime for flat rate people as well, so just be aware of that. Again, not paying them for supplemental items. The repair center is not paid. That means that if we don't get paid for a procedure, we don't, get, we don't pay them for a procedure. Is that fair? Yeah, because the last time I saw them, when they took their knee and popped the Nissan quarter out, it popped out perfect with no mud work. They just had to do a little, little de-stressing you know, de some metal. They didn't go, boss, I get paid way too much in this one, right? I mean, we win and we lose, right? So the point is, is that you're, you're going to have to accept that. Here's a key one right here, though, that will be controversial for a lot of us. So for, for some of you, you've agreed to various, for various programs or fanners or things that you're belong that you're going to get a DRP discount. You have to take that from the tech. So if you give 5% back, take that 5% back away. It's only fair. And I know, remember, I said, feed the eagles. Pay them a bigger percentage if you have to, but you gotta, you gotta, if you don't get paid for it, you shouldn't pay for it, right? So just watch that. Being sure mechanical and frame flat rates are paid at the standard body rate. Why is that? Because we have a lot of tooling. I mean, if you want, you go down right now and buy one of those cool IQ four welders, IQ of I five welders from ProSpot. I, I, I was down there today. Said twenty nine to thirty thousand dollars for one welder. So those are the special tools that I need to invest in. That's why I'm paying you that smaller flat rate. Okay. If you if you weld with that thing is bad to the bone. I can even weld with it. I mean, it's literally super easy. But if you, not having that tool makes it. Or having that tool makes them very, very efficient. Okay? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, man. Labor time. Yep. They can't. There's no, I mean, the admin's paid for by the gross profit you made, and you, you're basically netting it out of that. You can if you wanted to, but your, your, your pay plan has to consider it. Yeah, we, let's talk about it after. It's a, it's a deep, deeper topic. All right, so let me just get into this. This will show you tiered flat rate. This is a little different way of looking at it, okay? So in this example, I'm going to put both of them up here at the same time. If you paid everybody a standard flat commission of 40%, in other words, everybody got paid 40, you basically be paying out 20 bucks uh, per, per hour, okay? And if we did, in this example, I use the preppers and stagers making 18 and the painter making 20, you can see that I'm paying out uh, less. So my overall gross profit is 62.4 versus 60. So I'm basically saying on the lower skill, I pay a lower flat rate than I pay on the higher skill stuff. Make sense? Now, how might this apply to body? Could I pay the R&I and the, and, the, and the filler person maybe 40 or 38%? gross profit and pay the welding frame tech 42? 
the eagle, right? So I'm, I pay the eagle the higher 42, I pay the apprentice 38, and I tell them they have a career path, right? When you start to learn more and do more and more skills, I slowly pick up your, your percentages and you, and you make a little bit more. That, when somebody comes to, run, to, to, to a court and to your, to your league, eagles, you better have prepared yourself because the eagles are being attacked right now by recruiters by every one of these big MSOs. Rightly so, they're gold, right? So feed your eagles. Get it? Hopefully. <laughs> All right. All right, so obviously we want to look at the benefits of what works in your market. Some techs don't care about benefits. Some markets have really low benefits. Others, the techs have figured out, wow, 401k match adds 6% or 4% more to my wage. I got I to gotta, I gotta factor that in. You have to explain to the techs what's called true cost of labor. Here's the true benefits I'm paying. Here's what it adds up to. And once a year or twice a year, just hand them a statement that says, here's what you're getting. Because when they get talk to their buddies at the racetrack or wherever about what they're making, what are they talking about? The percentage or the hourly rate that they're getting, not all the benefits. But when they go, wow, the boss pays another 25% on top of my wage, where I go somewhere else, they may only pay 20. That's 5% more. I got to factor that in. That's real, right? So I got to figure that out. All right. So obviously, there's different kinds of pay plans out there, and I'm not going to teach a, a pay plan class, but you have. Basically, hourly is super easy to administer. You can ask them to do whatever you want, and you have plenty of time to verify quality, right? Um, obviously, it's easy to administer. Basically, it's, 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 it's a great, may, great method when the shop is busy, busy. Teams are excellent with this. It works out great. Um, but on the other side, there's some disadvantages. Basically, we need to make sure they're working on productive tasks, because it gets very easy for them to be floating off into maintenance of the shop, fixing your restoration project, going over and fixing the building, and losing some profitability there. Less incentive. They're not incented to produce. They're like, hey, you get paid, boss pay me X amount of hour, I'm gonna get paid no matter what. I'll work slow as fast as I, as, as I, as I choose to today, okay? Again, difficult to justify raise, raises if the business is slow. So if you're in a tough economic time and there's some competitive pressure over your people, I can't look you in the eye and say give them a raise because there's no money there to give them raises. One of the hourly things that you have to be aware of uh, on hourly is if they're hourly and you write a low repair time or you miss a labor operation, they don't always have an incentive to bring that up and make sure that you get reimbursed for that because I, I'm getting paid the same no matter what it is. You need to make sure that those things are still brought to the table or you're going to lose those labor opportunities if they're missed. And again, I, I, this is a... Um, so this is, there is a, a formula, which I don't want to get into the, a deep formula, on how to tell them how many hours they need to turn to justify their wage, but they need to know that number. So if they're making 20 and I have to turn 60 hours to make, to justify my $20 an hour wage, they need to know that number so they have a goal. That's to Scott's point. All right, so the second one is obviously flat rate. Um, obviously the insurance company is paying, or is paying us a certain amount and we're just basically guaranteeing our gross profit, right? That's our, we're guaranteeing our gross profit. Obviously it, it, it's, it gives that incentive that Scott just talked about to point out those supplements and there's an incentive to increase productivity. So you kind of have, hourly is leading more towards teamwork and you know, esprit de corps and all that, but flat rate tends to drive more towards pushing more output. But the downside is obviously we could jeopardize what? Quality control. And Scott talked about these red binders. They better have read that red binder and followed that red binder and in their HR manual they should sign off that they, they understand they must follow those procedures all the time, okay? Super important. Quality control systems are super important in flat rate shop, and having people that really look over your shoulder is really helpful here. Again, it somewhat discourages a team approach unless you work in a flow environment where they work more as a team, okay? Um, again, they may make shortcuts requiring buffing because in a lot of cases they don't pay. So who buffs? Who buffs? Painter. Painter buffs, right? Why, why does the painter need to buff? If you're a pig, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta cl clean up your own slop. Right? So the bottom line is the painter, painter buffs. If you're going to say, well, I, I don't choose to do that, Steve, do this. Charge them the wage plus another wage on top of it. So that you pay that, that de detailer 15 bucks an hour, charge them 30. Why, would you, why are you justified in charging them 30 for the detail time? What could you have done with that labor hour? What percent were you making? 60%, right? So I could take that labor resource that was being spent buffing cars and spend them prepping cars 
disassembling something, doing something valuable. Instead, I'm doing this wasteful activity, which is basically what? Buffing. All right, so how do you prevent buffing? Very simple, anti-stat, number one, right? What's anti-stat do? It takes, it just, it, it de-stats the, the panel and the dust falls right off of it. Second thing is never, ever, ever, and this is gonna be different than every one of your shops probably, allow them to do any prep work in the booth. And my favorite, my favorite activity is this one, because they think they should, they should be able to do this in the booth. What's this activity? Putting the plastic on. What are they doing right now? Every dust, everything in the booth is just now being stirred up because like, oh, it's easier here. No, oh, there's a spot right here outside of the booth called staging. We should be doing that in. So basically, I want to get everything in what I call setup reduction, the area of staging in front of the booth. That thing needs to be totally ready. Yeah, sometimes I put bags over the tires or put magnets so I can see when I drive it in there. But ultimately, get most of that bagging and all that done, pre-tack it, and then pull it in and paint it. Nothing, nothing gets prepped in the booth, ever. We'll cut that dramatically, okay? All right, so when we get done with this, and, and jump in if, you, if I miss something here, um, this is basically what we get in our management system. This is the labor analysis. It's telling us the hours we got, our gross profit, our actual cost, actual gross profit on this job. It tells us who logged in, how many hours, and what their efficiency is. And it's telling us in every job, well, what do we do? We kind of ignore it. We forget it. It's there. All of our management systems have it, but we don't look at it very closely. Okay? We've got to pay attention to that because it's telling us when we're losing gross profit on a job-by-job -job basis. All of our management systems have a gross profit report in them. Now I happen to choose, I cut and pasted the CCC two sections here, put them right next to each other, but it's all on that report. Okay? All right. Here's a, here's a couple of rules. Number one, always electronically order parts. Paper precedes process. Nobody ever, ever, ever should order a part using a phone, ever. 100% rule. Call the vendor, say, don't accept, uh, unless I it comes with paper, don't trust me. Because I'm, I'm not to be trusted, even me. Because <laughs> what happens? You forget. And then when you forget, what happens? When you go to cl close the ticket, it's not, it's not, there's no labor there, or assuming there's no parts there. Okay, make sure uh, we get that inspection and images up front. Again, that painting complex and uh, assemblies I talked about earlier. When adding parts lines, always use the current list price. So, the day I send the order, I want them to send me a, a reminder to my email or to my phone, my voicemail, telling me the amended part price that day. What do we do right now? What's the behavior we do right now? We wait until what shows up? Too late, because remember, we're auditing it for a final. We audited it for final. It should have been final when we were repairing planning, not six days later when I had a chance to in, enter all the invoices and get to this. The day the thing was ordered, I want that part price adjustment to come back that day so I can finalize it that day. Big discipline there, big change. Everybody get it? You good with that one? Okay. Never accept price matching, ever. That, is a, that was a mistake. They were like, oh, I'm going to price match this. What do you need to do instead? What, right there it is. I will always cost match, never price match. And I'm telling you guys, it happens to you probably two to three times a day where you fall victim to this one, where the, the vendor sends it to you and says, oh, the OE price was this, I'll match it, or the, the salvage price was this, I'll match it. The salvage cost was what, I'll match that, and I'll give you the discount on top of that. Big difference, big difference in margin there, okay? Never accept parts which are not a discount per the, the agreement. They go, oh, we don't, give, we don't give full discount on airbags. Um, when we struck the deal, it was X off on all my parts, not, oh, on electronics, we don't do it. On this one, oh, we got a high return rate. No, a fixed percent. I, I expected you to factor that in so, uh, so the computer would basically do it every time. Again, markup appropriate to your salvage and alpha market parts. Remember the difference between markup and discount, right? Make sure you, you te teach your people that. Make sure all your add-on parts, little add-on parts of the clips, the little liners, make sure all that gets a separate line and gets noted, because a lot of times those things will slip onto an invoice, 10, 15 bucks at a time, those little, little things show up. We have what's called a 720 degree mirror match. Can you explain that, Scott? Um, 
and let him get the speaker on. 720 mirror matches, we tend to, to look at a bill, pull a part out, we look at it straight up, it's not the same or we think it is. You should look at a 360, turn it over, look at a 360 again. Take a Mercedes bumper cover um, that's got 46 different options for the Mercedes bumper cover, right? You can look at the outside, it looks perfect. You tip it over and do the same 360 inside and you're gonna find the attachment points or a sensor mark, a holding spot is different as a result of it. So we call it now a 720 degree mirror match. 360 around, over 360 around. Way different than two seconds looking at it for damage on the corners and moving on. Next one is Uber or Lyft to pick up your parts. I need a part, I need cycle time, what do I do? I call Uber, I, they can bring a part in what? Half hour from a dealership? So consider using creative things like Uber or Lyft to, to rush those critical parts to you instead of waiting. That's a small fee. In some cases, the insurance is going to be able to pay for it because what were they going to pay for instead? A rental day. Heck of a lot more than a small Uber bill. Again, follow up your credits with the Resolve. Could you use Uber to help you with credits? Yes, right? You could say, I want to get this stuff returned today. I'm going to call Uber X, which is a Suburban or whatever, and have them haul the quarterback for you. Now you gotta get a friendly Uber driver, but, but ultimately it kinda, kinda works, right? All right, so these are some tips for parts, and there's tons more, I could, we could literally teach a whole parts class. Again, on the parts thing, you gotta watch your gross profit percentage. Right here, you basically negotiate a specific discount. Your job is to look for, are those discounts what you agreed to for that manufacturer? If they aren't, it should be throwing a flag to you to go back and look for all these exceptions. Part price increases, not giving you the proper discounts, clips and things that got added, all those things are, are going to contribute, okay? You notice we got paid for something here, stock parts. What's that all about? Worth, and all these guys like to sell us clips and fasteners, we use them at the end. When should we be pulling those clips and fasteners? As we're doing what? Tearing the car down. Because the last thing we got time to do is at the end of the job going, oh, I got to turn one more supplement in for $8. Okay, it's not going to happen. So what we need to do is get use the pan or some form of tool um, to basically, wherever we find a broken clip, put it in the, the pan, basically how it works is there's, there's a pan, there's a spot for each of them. There's one in the innovation, an innovative system, uh, a rack place down here, just to show them. Basically, you take it apart, you put it, take them, clips and fasteners in this order. When you put it back together, you reverse it. So no laying the bucket or parts out. You pull all the clips and fasteners at the time and you get paid for them so you make your profit on that. The okay. only thing different on that, Steve, is you would probably assign an in-house cost of 50%, um, something to that effect, because it's not going to be 100% margin. We know we pay for those clips and fasteners, so you just assign it as in-house clips and fasteners, a cost factor of 50%, and then it... But do you see how I'm looking at a P&L right here on every job? That's what I got to look, look at this as a P&L on every job. I got to look at this during, during this time, okay? Paint materials, obviously, things that will affect it will be paint labor sales, the reimbursement rate and getting things posted properly. Our goal is to get sales mix at 10% or higher, our paint material margin at 40% or higher. So what we're looking for here, before you start calling your paint guys and get, in, get into them, make sure your data is pure, okay? What I mean by that is make sure things are coded right. So my, my uh, gun washer, I bought a gun washer, is that paint materials? No, that gun washer is gonna take months to years to, to use, so that's equipment, shop equipment, that shouldn't be in there. So you just gotta make sure things are in the right bucket, okay? Uh, then you want to calculate your inventory fluctuations. So have a standard inventory in your system, whether you have an automated inventory tool. There's about three or four really good automated tools, a manual system. But basically, to replenish your inventory to a standard stock level, don't overstock it or understock it at month end. Just run it to a standard number. Then you won't have a up and down. But if you bought a whole bunch of extra stock or ran it way down, it'll affect your margin. Let's you know, just, just test your knowledge. If I boost and buy more inventory, what will happen to my paint material profitability? Go up or down? It'll go down, right? So that's kind of how we got to look at it. And then the last one is make sure you're putting your discounts in. So whatever you got on invoice plus whatever cash and prizes you, you've got given by the insurance or the paint company, basically make sure all that's factored and then calculate your gross profit, okay? So the things in kind of order of what we've seen, ways to improve margin, number one is right here, over mixing, okay? So with our product, it's one and a half coats wet on wet. So people need about two ounces per paint labor hour. When we work at a lot of shops, we'll see 3.5 to 4, 4 ounces per hour, which means that they leave, what's in the cup? 
half of what they needed. Like, like they, they mixed twice what they needed to spray that car. Okay, so really getting good on how many hours are on the car, how many ounces per hour, whether it be base coat, clear coat, even primer at 0.81. So primer at 0.81 ounces per hour, base at two and 1.8 for clear. So really watching how much we're mixing because we don't want to overmix and throw it away, right? Because you're going to have more problems with the EPA. I don't know if you guys saw the California lawsuit that was done by the, uh, the, again, the garbage raid they did in California recently where they, they went in the garbage and they found the, all, the, all this hazardous waste in the garbage. In Alameda County, I mean, that liquid paint they were putting in the garbage cans, thousands of dollars of, of, of fines. Okay, um, next thing is use the color tools. I mean, these color tools are fantastic, and, and we shouldn't be having color mixed problems. We use a program called a hit on a hit, which means that you mix a color, you do some different things to make it work, take another picture of that. Why would we do that? It teaches the camera what? That's the right mix. Remember that the next time I do it. Okay, it's called a hit on a hit. Okay. Again, proper reflect. We use the, use the proper uh, product list. Here's one of the one of the paint company's tricks over the years. I work for a paint company, but here's one of the tricks. Your clear's not working. What do we do? I got a new clear. Why do I need to tell them a new clear? Because they weren't listening to me about how to use the last one. They're going to be like, how do I apply that? What's the, what's the distance? What was? Oh, I have to change my tip. I have to. Oh, I have to do this. And they do it right. And sure enough, it follows. It works perfectly. We now have been teaching. One standard clear across the country, we've, count, we've taken 49 clears out of her, and we're going to see more. We're going to keep taking them out. The clear works. There's no reason to switch clear. It was that the painters weren't listening to us about how to do it right. Okay, so, so just, just be, be sensitive to that, and there's a waste that goes with, with changing all that. Here's, a, here's another trick. Every two pounds of air pressure, it's 12% less paint. Where is the extra air pressure? Where's the paint going? Into the, into the filters, right? You're painting the filters, you're not painting the car. So 24 to 26 pounds of air pressure. What were they all taught? 30. Dial that baby back, but you gotta have your paint rep in there to show them how to do it. Doesn't matter what paint brand, just get them to paint with less air pressure, you'll have less waste, okay? Again, reduce your allied product waste, that's tape, that's all those different things of not using an inch, two inches, two, two inches, that use an inch and a half, not using paper, use plastic, and all those kinds of things. All right, one of the other things you can do now is you can connect your paint system to your management system. Again, I'm not specific to my, my own company. We happen to do it with CCC, Profit, and other companies. The point is, is that now the cost from the scale can be put into the management system so you see actual cost in there. Where in the past it was assumed cost. Okay, an assumed cost says I want to make 45%. It puts in just a magic number to make 45% happen. So basically we don't, we don't, we don't have that. So we, there's just a system utility to do that. All right, so obviously on, on the job, you, you want to periodically, if you don't use this, this automatic feature, periodically you want to check your real P&L number for paint material costs or your, pro, your profit and put that in. So when it, it does the assumed cost for paint materials here, it basically uses what you're really doing, not some made up number. Because the system will all, you tell it 45, every month you're going to make 45, but then your P&L is one point down because your real paint material profitability was less. All right, the next one, profitability at time of pre-closing. So pre-closing is basically no less than four hours prior to delivery. So if we're going we're gonna to close that file like we're closing it, four hours prior to delivery, why is that? What's that? We have time to fix it, exactly, okay? Time to fix it, all right? So it, basically we want to we wanna obtain all the agreement from everybody because once the key goes in the, the hands of the customer, we've lo lost our, basically our mechanics lien, right? So we want to basically make sure that final bill number is exactly what we want it to be when the customer picks up and signs off on the final bill. Okay? Um, we want to make sure that um, we track down all the doc documentation at this time. You should be using a pre-closed checklist. If you, if you don't, you should get one. Um, again, what we want to do is make sure that write it the way the insurance company re re requires it. But make sure that if they, if they that we have to move things to make it work in your management system, do it now. Some management companies call this redistribution. You guys familiar with that term? Where you at, the, at the end of the file, it, you got 100% profit here and a 0% a negative gross profit here, but I got to put them in the right bucket. The management system allows you to move things around right before you close and move it to the right bucket. So a lot of people, the insurance company wants you to write it a certain way, but to, to account for it, you may do it differently. Like Scott was just talking about this, uh, the stock parts. 
Now at the very end, we want to put in things like here's our driver credit. We were given aftermarket parts sales credit of 260 bucks, okay? We had uh, the, la the painter was going to do, the, let's say he was going to do the repair, and we needed some materials. If I put all that there, where's that going to go? It's going to go against parts profit, aftermarket parts profit. And my paint materials, I'm not going to have any materials to repair all those salvage parts that I'm repairing. So I need to move some money from the, the, the driver credit into the, into the paint materials category. What was I doing with the painter? I was overpaying them, right? I was overpaying them. So that's the difference there. OK. Um, we, we obviously want to make sure we deflag all the time. What's deflagging? Anybody know what deflagging is? Somebody that's hourly does something like put on a molding or a stripe, and who got paid for it? The body tech, right? So we shouldn't be paying. He didn't do it, so we need to deflag for it. Make sure all the, everything is allocated and flagged. Make sure all parts are recorded at the correct price. And we want to look for any zero parts gross, any zero parts gross profit, OK? So we want to look for any profit that's zero. Make sure all the credits have been received. Look for our below standard gross profit. Make sure our stock parts are in there. We get paid for all work that's been completed, and we get all of our supplements turned in. So we're just checking it one time, because we're about to deliver the car and close the ticket. When do a lot of shops do this closing activity? Thursday night, a week later, a lot of times when you, when you, when you finally had some time and the kids' ball games are done and there's a, a quiet night where you can just sit when nobody's bugging you and the files are about yay thick and you just want to get through them and you start rifling, right? The point is we want to do this, but who should be doing it? The owner manager or the estimator and the CSR? The estimator and the CSR should work as a team. So you should basically, when you sit and check these on a Saturday, like I, I still would check them, write down what the areas are and then do what the following week. Have a meeting and say, here are the things that I saw last week. Try and do these things yourself so I don't have to do them in the future. Otherwise, you're just constantly picking up the same pieces every, every month, OK? All right. Um, obviously, we're going to get a, a profitability on this job. Um, we're going to achieve the gross profit we're looking for. All right, now, um, two more things, two more points I want to make. There's one here that I want to make sure your P&L is accurate. It's called a work in process adjustment at the end of the month. Nobody does this right. Nobody does this right. Everything must be delivered. Everything that's been delivered to the customer by 6 p.m. delivered. Not, I think it's gonna. It looks. It's, it, we painted it. Okay. No, it's got it. The keys have to be in the customer's hand, and they have to be driving down the road for it to count for that month. Everybody agree with that? So just have that one month. You pull the bandaid off, guys. I know we, we've done it the other way. We've done it wrong for years. From now on, we're not living in fantasy land. We're living in reality. You don't deliver it, you don't get credit for it, OK? One month. It's ugly. It's ugly. It's real. Second thing, every single invoice that we're going to post for that month gets posted by 6 p.m. So the parts guy knows he doesn't leave, she doesn't leave until every invoice that, that day is posted in the last month. So everybody knows they got everything posted that day by 6 o'clock. I meet with a production manager. I need partial week payroll. Not paid, I'm just allocating for everything that was done up until now. Why am I doing that? Because next week I'm going to do a payroll, and it's going to reflect costs that were from last month, and I'm going to be paying it with this month, and my gross profit's going to look really good last month. This month it's going to look really bad. So that, that's, that's just a, if you don't pay it, you just allocate it. Okay? And then if you, have, if you, are, have, you do have fluctuations in paint material inventory, why am I doing this? Because your gross profit will go one month, it'll be 38, then it'll be 42, 39, 46, and it's all over the place. And whose fault was it? Yours. Lack of an accounting discipline. Because we got lazy. The rule is 6 o'clock, 6 o'clock, I let you have till 9 o'clock the next morning to close. But the files that closed, nobody can post data file ever. New rule. Nobody. Okay, it'll make your, gro your gross profits will be within a half a point of one another. Okay, all right, so now we filled the shop with profitable work. We got good sales mix, we're profitable. We have the ability to put some more work out the door. Now I want to show you something totally new. We just did a, a press release right before SEMA with CCC on this, and Craig's going to show a new feature within CCC1 that does production flow management. He's going to kind of show us how that works. So Craig, can you show us? Sure. 
Uh, yeah, it's right there. Let's see if I can figure it out now. Yeah. All right, so how should I start this? Well, first of all, like, I was here last week working with shops. Um, I flew home to Jersey, flew back. Um, last week I was up $150 in the, in the casinos, by the way. And while we're sitting here talking about profit and loss, I'm cracking up because I said, man, I was up 150 bucks. And then I realized that, you know, had about $200 in dinners and drinks and flight and hotel. So yeah, it was a big loss actually. Um, so over the course of time at CCC, we've been working more and more with the shops. We've been working with Exalta, a lot of other vendors. We're trying to listen more and more to uh, the needs and what makes the most sense because, uh, you know, somebody sitting in Chicago at, at, at a, a terminal might think this is an excellent idea and this is the right place to put a button. This is the right way to click through to something. But speaking to you guys who are doing it every day, uh, then you start to realize, well, maybe that's not the right place for the button or that's not the right, right way that you want to go through uh, repair planning. So over this past year in particular, I worked with Steve and, and, and we listened to a lot of the ideas and, and, and there's a place in Jersey called the Innovation Center that Exalta is working on. Um, we've implemented, implemented a couple of things there. Uh, within your CCC product, and, and once again, disclaimer, it's not a sales pitch, I'm just showing you something that is in there already. We did not develop a new piece of the product. We didn't, uh, we didn't go to uh, any, any tech support people and create something new. But within the CCC management product, there's a, a portion called the floor plan editor. Some of you may have touched it, some of you may have messed around with it, you may have seen other people using it. Uh, the original intent was you could map out your property, bushes, parking lot, bays, stalls, office. And when you're in that part of the product, you can actually move files in and out of where they are on your property. So with that thought in place, we started working a little deeper into, well, what's a better functionality of that? We spoke to some shops that use it as a virtual file rack. They created these file racks in their screen and they move electronic files within the file rack. So we came up with a little bit of a hybrid of the two. The one you're gonna see is kind of like the end result. Uh, it's customizable, we have a basic one, we have a more advanced one, it can be anything that you want. So what you see isn't necessarily what you have to have, it's just gone through a whole lot of incarnations. So, and, and you're gonna see it in the actual product. I'm gonna switch to the actual CCC product so you can see it. This is just a screenshot, but um, the basic idea behind this was I can take cars that are in their, their files, and you'll see the files, and they're just gonna move. Here's a parking lot on this end. There's a parking lot on this end. So what happens? The car arrives in the parking lot, and then in between is just flow. Flow, 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 going across. I'd say 80% of the cars are gonna go through these columns. When it has to drop down out of the normal flow of the shop, we drop it down into these areas. An ER, everybody's got a file that's gotta go into ER, it's, we, it's a mess. We don't know what's going on, the customer's not getting back to us. Uh, there Maybe there's a question about whether damage is related. Um, on hold, frame, mechanical, sublet. Um, some of our shops that we spoke to liked the idea of pulling cars down out of the normal flow into frame, so that way we know that they're residing in here until they come back up into the flow. So without getting into too much detail, that's the premise behind this. This exists in the management product as the floor plan editor. We're calling the production planning or production mapping view. So the, the key thing here, and it, for those of you guys that know flow, if I have basically, um, if I double the, in, the number of cars on my property, what will happen to my cycle time? It will also double. So basically it's called Little's Law. For every increase in inventory is an increase in the repair cycle time. So our job here is to reduce our cycle time. So what Craig and I are looking at doing is we're looking at every space on here where cars can sit, pending parts, pending repair plan, um, pending paint. And we're trying to shrink those cues to the smallest we possibly can. So we have what are called flow meetings with the techs where we basically look at this and the techs say, how do I pull versus push work through the shop? So what Craig's gonna show us is how this can be used as a pull processing tool. So now once we actually put vehicles into this, 
every one of these, and this is a great one because everybody's on time, it's all in yellow, nobody's red. Um, colors that you would see them in the repair plan in CCC. Yeah, so I'm going to show you guys that view. I'm going to show you what you're used to seeing, and, and it's very linear, it's very left to right. This is more for inside the shop. Now, the, the, the office will interact with the front end when the cars arrive. The office will interact with the back end when the cars leave. But this is more for your production manager in the shop, standing there talking to techs. Uh, we also, and I will show you, have the ability on a touch tablet to drag and drop these files from column to column to place to place. It interacts with your completing of phases, it interacts with your update plus pieces, uh, it, it interacts back with the production schedule that you see in CCC. So when we first came out with this, the fear that people had is, I can move it in here, it doesn't move it in repair plans. You've had that corrected, am I it right? Does. It now does. Now when you move it here, so it's not double keystroke, when you move it here, it does move it in repair plan, the other thing that's complex about this is I can look at each department or I can do it by body tech and I can tell how much is in each area. So at our innovation center, when they have their flow meeting every day, they look at it and they can tell who's ahead, who's behind. If I got way too many in one area and not enough in another, what does it allow me to do? It allows me the ability to now reallocate resource to where it's needed, when it's needed. I'm truly pulling the car along instead of trying to push it. Um, you here see go. here, there's a couple things he talked about. So here's a scheduled, right? Here's our fast track, okay? Here's our scheduled, uh, here's our towed in, scheduled arrive. So as you said, this is everything before it got here. Here's our pre, our scanning, then here's our repair planning. Here's a bunch of pending parts. This will get really deep when we get a lot of shops. Then once those cars are ready and, and are, they can be made ready, I can put them down here as pending, dis, as pending dispatch, or I can just grab them from here. Then I can basically sequence my body work and my paint work. But guys, I'm doing this with an iPad. I can walk the shop with this thing. So I don't have to worry about having a touch screen to carry with me. This, that can be up on the wall somewhere and I have what's called the duplicate display. So I can show the dudes in the shop, but I can now carry this out to our, our painter and say, which order do you want to do things in, okay? And so that's the concept. And then you notice over here on this financial section, you'll notice this is, this is when it says financials, what concept did I just teach about? The money made financials, it is what's called, what we call earlier, pre-closing, right? So the file goes from reassembly to pre-closing, so it, they know it's in, been pre-closed at some point, and of course, reassembly in detail. So one of the things we're looking to do is minimize the reassembly. How do you minimize reassembly? What I tell you earlier in the day about minimum, how can you minimize reassembly? Pre-paint and then transfer, right? So. As much, all those complex assemblies, if I can do that in advance, now I should be able to put a car back together in an hour, not two and three days. So when a car comes out of the, into the paint shop, the goal is that eight hours later can be delivered to the customer every time, except for maybe a train wreck. But the majority of the jobs, when it comes into the paint shop, I should know my flow all the way through, should be able to get done in eight hours and I can deliver that car in eight hours, that's the goal. The system should allow us to see that. So show us how the system does it live, please. To, to make a point on his <laughs> pre-close, uh, what we're teaching now, uh, and especially in my area in, in Jersey, uh, I'm adding this phase to all my shops, uh, even if they're not using this floor plan editor, in their actual repair plan, I'm, I'm adding this financials phase. I know for me, I could not stand that moment when a customer was coming to pick it up and there was all confusion and uh, what do you mean? Oh, I thought that original check was for my pain and suffering. I didn't realize it was for the original repairs. And now all of a sudden they're picking up at six o'clock on a Friday night and they have the $4,000 original check. Uh, I couldn't stand that. Uh, a lot of what I do at CCC now is driven by bad experiences that I had on the shop side. I don't want to say bad experiences. It more like I learned from those errors and those mistakes. Um, so this financials phase is a period of time where after the car is coming out of paint, the office is now connected to the repair plan and the office has to now complete checklist items within that financials phase. Did I call the customer and let them know what their deductible is and that, yes, you have to bring it with you when you come to pick up. Did the, 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 the estimator contact the insurance company and make sure that they knew that the supplement checks gotta come to them and here's my DOP. Uh, that financials phase for us, I know, I know Steve said a minimum of four hours. We want to make sure that that's happening a couple days before the end, just to make sure that there's enough space. We don't want that 
ugliness at delivery. We want to be able to get people to come in, take their keys, give us their, their checks that they owe or whatever is left, and off they go. And there's none of that, oh, I didn't know. And, and now they've already been dumped off by the rental car company and they don't have a way back. It's just, we're trying to avoid that. So I had to make that point last, uh, a little bit more about that financial space. Now, so here's, this is, this is what we've been working on, right? Um, here's more what you're used to seeing when you look at CCC in, in the production schedule. You're used to seeing this. Um, very left to right, you're looking at the body phase, you're looking at the pending parts phase, it just goes left to right as to where you're at. You're looking down this day as this is your current day. Um, this what's makes a lot the, of- What's up with the color? So all the yellows mean you're on time, you're current on those phases. Red means you're behind schedule, green means you're good, you completed those phases. And these phases are all customizable. You'll see if you were come up here closer, you could see where that financials phase resides. Um, you could see, I don't know if you can see, but I will show you in a minute. Down here we've had, we, we've used priority flags to indicate every one of these files has a priority associated with it. This becomes pretty key in using that floor plan editor, and I'm gonna show you second. why. Let me show you one thing before you switch screens. So do you see this line right here? Total, uh, total hours, every here optimal whip, okay? Optimal whip. So if you wanna get a car done in six days, right, and you have 60 hours a day, right, you should, be able, should have 10 cars, right? So the idea is then you basically just, you, well, wait, I can run you through the math if you want uh, offline, but you should know your optimal whip. In other words, how many hours you need on site. If you have more than the optimal whip, what should you do? Not the next day to keep bringing them in because you're gonna, you're gonna crush yourself. So the idea is this screen right here, even though we're not gonna use it for production, the, the, the thing that we still need to grab off of this screen is the number of vehicles and the whip to drive our scheduling discussion for the following day so we don't keep bringing things in. Or if we're short, we know to bring more work in so we don't run short in the paint shop, okay? So that's basically a really important feature to keep your eye on, optimal whip. That's right, and it's not necessarily telling you exactly what to do and exactly how many cars I can take. There's always gonna be a human interaction there. Uh, you don't want the front desk person to think, oh, that's it. You know, we've reached that number, that's it, no more cars. But then you got, like, you, you just passed on two bumper jobs that you could have pulled in and had some filler work that could have been out in two days. So there's always going to be some human interaction. And remember, this is a tool. CCC on the whole is a tool. It's no different than a pro spot welder or um, Axo Nobel or Exalta. It, it's just another tool to help you guys do your business. We're just hoping that the more we put in here to answer questions, it, you know, it's one-stop shopping. It's all right in here for you. Um, so let's talk about those uh, priority flags within that uh, floor plan editor and why that's important. So when we talk about flow, like Steve educated me back in March when we first started talking about this, we want to make sure that at a glance, your production manager, while they're standing in the shop, can quickly ascertain where the trouble is. Where am I going to be slow today, tomorrow? Where am I going to be slow uh, for the rest of the week? And where do I need to pull in and work from? What we've added to this is a f the first column out here talks about scheduled one, two, and three. Uh, that's weeks out. So now if you're a production manager, you're standing there having your production meeting and you're noticing that you're a little skinny in body and there's not much else on site, he can look left and see what's scheduled in the future and these priority flags that you see that we've assigned have to do with the severity. So I can look back to the left and see what's scheduled in the future of course, if there's an estimate written on it. Um, I can look to the left, look at severity and say, well, I, can, I could certainly grab a couple of the heavy jobs, a couple of the newer jobs. Let me tell the office to call these people and see if they can come in early. Not always the case and not always possible, but at least it gives you the ability to look and know and plan. So when you look at some of these cars that are in here, that priority flag, and let's see if I can, I, I mean, I know people in the back of the room aren't necessarily gonna see it. When we first did it, we did it very simply by dollar figure. And we know that's not very realistic when an Audi headlight's $2,800. So uh, we talked about changing that to hours and we'll get a good compilation from a lot of different shops as to what severity levels uh, in terms of hours. Um, the other thing that you see here in the priority flags are these numbers. Um, kind of neat little side topic. Those numbers, if you assign, when the cars get to paint, if you assign them a number, 
you can sort your paint by those numbers and print out a paint list in the priority order that you want, as long as you use those numbers. So if I have five cars going to paint and I assign them that one, two, three, four, and five in the order that I want it done, I can print that list and hand it to my painter and those are the five cars that I want painted today in that order. So that's just a nice uh, little aside. So the way this is supposed to function, the office gets a car, uh, I mean, excuse me, gets a customer, they convert it to a RO. When they convert it to an RO, it lands down here. And now it's just sitting there waiting for them to do the next thing. Once they've scheduled this car and given it a date, it comes up into here. It's got color and, and we know whether it's scheduled for this week, next week, or three weeks out. Uh, the office, once that car does arrive, they're actually moving it on the schedule here to arrive and it's in the parking lot. Okay, Craig, one of the things is, you're, is, you're, is it looks like there's just these single blocks. If you've got six cars, you're going to see six little blocks in there. Correct. So it's going to make, make it smaller accordingly. <laughs> so, so he just got what I would call probably minimum data in here right now. Um, yeah, I didn't want to overload it and have it all be right. too small. But what I was going to do is show you guys. So if these cars get moved in here and this car just arrives, and all I'm doing is dragging and dropping, and then I mark the vehicle in. It's not going to let me right now, right in front of everybody. There we go. And now this one, let's say this one came in. And, and I could just keep stacking those up. Uh, I could fit a multitude in there. I could fit probably 12 or 15 in that uh, slot. If that's not enough for a very busy shop, I make the columns bigger. It's like I said, it's fully customizable for what works. These areas in here, the reason why we've divided these out into body tech A, one, two, three, four. It allows us to prioritize their work and say, I want you working on this car first, second, third, and fourth. This could be simplified into just one big body column, uh, or it could be divided out into the number of body techs you have. It's totally up to you. We just found that in implementing this, uh, there was a lot of value in shops being able to look at this at a glance. A production manager could have that conversation during the meeting and, and make it what you want it to be to make the most sense during the day. Uh, in a Surface Pro in this case, uh, I'm not, this isn't an advertisement for Surface Pro, but a Surface Pro with a little connection to uh, a, a, an HD TV, he can walk around with the Surface Pro, drag and drop throughout the day, drag and drop while he's talking to a technician and move things to where they have to be. Um, and that's the, pro the, go ahead. And again, all I'm trying to do is get the most information that I can get out of view. So I, again, if, it's, if something's not right, if it's backed up, it needs to be visual so I can see it. I can't fix it if I can't identify it. So this view is de determined really quickly for a production manager to, I to identify the bottlenecks so we can commit the resources to fix them, whether that's bringing work in, whether it's getting work out, or whether it's moving people. Okay, Craig, uh, any questions, I guess, for Craig on this? This is pretty, yeah, go ahead. So all the management systems have this in there. It's called the floor plan editor. Um, I'm trying desperately to call it production mapping instead of uh, floor plan editor. Production planning, isn't it? But we'll see. Uh, but yeah, so if you look up here in this top right corner where it says view, that's what you're seeing. So if you go into the floor plan editor, that's where you can actually create this. And what we're trying to do with, uh, with everybody in CCC is we're trying to create this for you. So if someone were to call us and say, hey, you know what, I kind of want to take a look at this. We ask you a couple of high level questions. All right, what are you talking about? Do you want parking lot? Do you want, is it, do you have an excessive amount of toes for total losses? And then we customize this as to what works for your place. Uh, do you want it divided out by tech? Do you want it divided out by paint team? And then once we've duplicated this, and it's, it's literally drag and drop from the boxes down below, make them the size you want, and label them. I have business cards up here. If you guys want to reach out, it's, it's still something that we're developing a plan for as to how to roll it out. There's 36 of me across the country, so you should all have your own CCC reps in your territory. Once we roll it out to them, so that way they know how to do this quickly and easily for you, then it's just something that you can start messing around with and use on your own. Now, uh, another key figure that Steve had talked about originally was, well, how can I, uh, how can I report against these, um, these, these categories? Like, how, can I get uh, how many hours of paint I have sitting, residing in my paint? Um, the, the answer is yes. I can go into my print preview by phase. And now there's each of my categories, each of my phases. So I'm looking at body, 
And right now, I have 107.9 hours sitting in body. I can go a little further and I can start looking at um, paint, and I can see how many hours I have sitting residing in paint. So real quick, at a glance, I can see it on the production schedule, I can see where everything's at, then I can quickly go to my report and see how many hours are sitting in there. Um, if I sort this by just one phase, that's where those priority flags with the numbers come into place where I can say, here's my five paint jobs in the order that I want them, print, hand it to my painter and say, here it go. I don't want to see you till the end of the day. All right, so we did four things. Number one was the write a good sheet. Two, job costs and get all the costs Paper precedes the process, write a good pay plan, okay? Three was basically pre-close and audit that, audit that, excuse me, audit the file. And we're pre-closing and closing the file and making a profit, and then and we're gonna use our production systems to drive more work through the door. So hopefully, the drive for 45 is yours, and you're gonna give us high scores in your CSI on your way out, so thank you very much.